Hello and welcome to Chinese Food Around the World. I'm Emily Baum and this webinar has been brought to you by the Long U.S. China Institute at UC Irvine. So last week, one of the news items that was generating a lot of conversation and controversy on my social media feed was a report that Panda Express, the American fast food chain, had opened up a restaurant in the Chinese city of Kunming. Now these reports couldn't be officially verified, but that didn't stop people from expressing their very strong opinions on the matter. WeChat users in China claimed that nobody but foreigners would wanna eat there since it was only American style Chinese food and therefore not authentic. On Twitter, opinions were a little bit more mixed. One commenter wrote that he loved the type of junk Chinese American food that Panda Express offered, while another stated that when she goes to China, she misses fake Chinese food and would definitely be a customer. At the heart of the conversation was a debate over what constituted real, authentic, and good Chinese food. And the consensus, for better or worse, was that Panda Express was Americanized Chinese food and therefore both inauthentic and inferior. But according to the culinary director of Panda Express, the menu is authentic. It's simply an adaptation of traditional Chinese cooking. So how in the end are we supposed to judge the quality or the authenticity of Chinese food? And what more broadly do we even mean when we talk about Chinese food in the first place? Well, to help me answer that question, I am joined today by three culinary experts, each of whom have devoted a large part of their lives and their careers to studying the history and practice of Chinese cooking, both in China and around the world. We are going to have a conversation with them today. And if you would like to ask a question at any point, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And again, you don't have to wait for the Q&A portion of this webinar to ask a question. You can really ask at any time. We will collect those questions and ask them for you on your behalf. So let me introduce my speakers. Fuchsia Dunlop is a cook and food writer. In 1994, she became the first foreigner to enroll at the Sichuan Institute of Higher Cuisine. She's the author of six books on Chinese cooking, including most recently, The Food of Sichuan, which was nominated for this year's James Beard Award for International Cookbook. And perhaps the best way to introduce Fuchsia is to read an excerpt from an email that I received from one of my UCA co UCI colleagues over the weekend. He wrote to me and just to kind of quote from his email, he said, I do not trust cookbooks. Whenever I cook, I spend most of my time watching YouTube videos or cross-referencing various recipes, but Fuchsia's depth of knowledge has really allowed me for once to trust a cookbook properly. So that should give you some sense of just how esteemed she is. Miranda Brown is a professor of Chinese studies at the University of Michigan. She is the author of two books on early Chinese history, including The Politics of Mourning in Early China, and most recently, The Art of Medicine in Early China. And she's currently working on a new research project on the history of dairy in Chinese cooking, which I am quite intrigued by, and we are going to be talking about a little bit more in the webinar today. Now, last but certainly not least is my colleague, Yong Chun, who's a professor of history at the University of California, Irvine. He's the author of Chop Suey USA, The Rise of Chinese Food in America, and his food research has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times. A few years ago, he was also the co-curator of a museum exhibit on the history of Chinese restaurants in the United States, and that exhibit appeared at the Museum of Chinese in the Americas in New York City. So thank you all for being here and let's get right into the conversation. So Fuchsia, you've obviously spent a lot of time studying, thinking about, writing about Chinese food. I mean, you took cooking classes in Sichuan, but you've also published recipes from places like Hunan, Guangdong, Fujian, among other places. So to get us started, um, maybe could you talk a little bit about what sorts of characteristics differentiate one type of regional cuisine from another? And in the course of your travels or your studies, did you ever get the sense that one type of regional cuisine is perhaps considered more authentically Chinese than any other? Well, I suppose in terms of the differences um, between regional cuisines, the first thing to get is that China is so enormous I always say that it's more of a continent than a country. So you've got very, very different geographical circumstances and cultures 
and sort of international contacts as well in different parts of the country. So the scope and variety of Chinese cuisines is simply dazzling. And this is something I've been exploring for about 25 years now. And I'm still, you know, fairly frequently going to new parts of China and discovering entirely new, um, you know, mini cuisines and ways of thinking about food and dishes. So it's a dizzying scale. And there have been lots of different ways of expressing, uh, sort of trying to sum up regional cuisines in a way that is comprehensible, sort of you know, generalizing. And probably um, the best known are the, the idea of the four great cuisines, roughly corresponding to North, South, East and West. There's another scheme of the so-called eight great cuisines, um, which brings in lesser known cuisines like um, the food of Anhui, for example, um, and of Fujian, right? Um, but um, I think, it's important to realize that the, these are all fairly recent schemes. So, so although the idea of regional variety um, dates back a long time in China, and for example, there are descriptions of restaurants serving food from the Sichuan area in the Song Dynasty, um, that actually the, the scheme of regional cuisines is comparatively recent. I read a fascinating article by a Chinese journalist who looked at the evolution of discussing regional cuisines and um, who, who found that the, the, the idea of the eight great cuisines and the four great cuisines is something that really only came into play after the Cultural Revolution. So although there were attempts to sort of um, write regional cookbooks a bit earlier than that, it's quite recent. But um, I would say that um, the way in which cu cuisines are recognized as cuisines is very much um, sort of rooted in historical, often in the relative wealth and prestige of different areas. So for example, the fact that in the eight great cuisines, you talk about Anhui cuisine, which is one that's really very little known now, but it was a region that sent out all these Hui Shang, the prosperous merchants that have huge influence, huge influence all over China. So um, it's very, you know, the ways in which you carve China into cuisines is very much a product of particular circumstances. Personally, I think that it's like a kind of fractal pattern and the more you look into it, um, the more it divides up into sort of more and more intricate regional cuisines. But most helpful, I think, is this idea of four rough culinary regions, north, south, east and west. And that brings out, for example, the difference between the wheat eating north of China. So you have this huge northern region in which wheat is the staple food. Um, and that's where you get the greatest variety of noodles and buns and dumplings and so on. Um, you get quite strong flavorings, vinegar and garlic. Um, you, off, you also get um, the presence of lamb and mutton because of the influence of the pastoral um, um, sort of peoples on the fringes of China and the different terrain. And then in the south, you have the rice growing region. So that's one of the greatest difference, um, differences. And then in terms of cuisine, so the Cantonese South associated with incredibly fresh food, um, with um, very vibrant seafood. And that's where the stereotype, I mean, Westerners have always talked about the Chinese eating everything. Um, from a Chinese point of view, it's the Cantonese who eat everything that moves. Um, and then in the east of China, you get broadly speaking, the cuisines of the Jiangnan region. Um, sometimes known as Su Tsai, the food of Jiangsu or the Shanghai cuisine. And um, this is a cuisine which is very much associated with the sort of um, grand tradition of literary gastronomy. Many of the great food writers of China came from this region. It's also a region that's um, crisscrossed by sort of rivers and streams and lakes. And you have a lot of water products there. So not only seafood from the coast, but river crabs and eels and water plants like water chestnuts and um, jiao bai, water bamboo or wild rice stem. And then very, um, um, wonderful sort of secondary ingredients and flavorings like uh, jinhua ham, zhenjiang vinegar, and so on. And this is a cuisine which um, one of the stereotypes is that it's very sweet, which really comes from a sub-tradition from Suzhou and Wuxi, where a lot of the 
um, not just the, what we think of perhaps as desserts, but the main dishes are very, very sweet. Um, but actually it's a cuisine of very delicate flavors, balanced cooking, extreme attention to seasonal food, lots of um, playful names and dishes with his histories and so on. And then in the West, you get um, usually known shorthand for Chansai Sichuanese cuisine. And that's where you get the bold, spicy, spicy flavors. And, um, you know, you can, it's a bit simplified because you also have Hunan, Guizhou, Yunnan, which are also sort of spice loving provinces. So that's a kind of rough sketch, but actually it's far more complex than that. And then you are the question about which is most authentic, but um, I think it's, I think in, in China, people are very, very concerned with getting the true flavor of local areas when they go traveling, for example, and, you know, the, the proper, um, such and such a seasoning or such and such an ingredient from a particular place, you know, the concern that people think of as being a modern Western idea of terroir and provenance, you know, goes back in China. But, um, but in terms of authenticity, um, I, I don't know, I mean, there's the idea of Zhongtan as a, a sort of Chinese style of food, but it's really, in my experience, only used sort of oppositionally to, you know, is it Western food or Chinese food? Because it's very imprecise. Um, and if you think about a national cuisine, for example, if you look at the banquet menus at the Great Hall of the People, where, where Chinese cuisine is showcased in, in diplomatic settings, then you have a sort of assembly of classic dishes from different regions like gong bao chicken and um, the um, squirrel fish from the Jiangnan region and so on. So um, I don't think that there's any um, particular regional cuisine that is seen as more authentic, but I would say that the cuisines which are most popular and most prestigious tend to vary for historical reasons. So for example, when I was living in Sichuan in the 1990s, um, uh, of course, the south of China, the special economic zones and Hong Kong um, got rich first. Cantonese cuisine was the prestige cuisine. Um, but now there's a fashion for Sichuanese, which everyone is crazy about. So it's something that's changed. That was a fantastic overview. Something that's very helpful, I'm sure, for everyone who's watching. But I think you really highlighted that there's just a tremendous amount of regional diversity, even within the geographical borders of China itself, not to even mention how Chinese food gets transformed beyond the borders of China. And I um, you know, I started this webinar with the introduction of Panda Express. And for anyone who's ever been to Panda Express, they'll know that one of the signature dishes on its menu is orange chicken chicken. Now, Miranda, you teach classes on the history of Chinese food, and I know that one of the examples you give to sort of get at this question of authenticity in Chinese cuisine is the example of orange chicken. So could you talk a little bit about how you use orange chicken to get your students thinking critically about what it means for Chinese food to be authentic or inauthentic? Okay, thank you. Um, well, so I mean, orange chicken for me is an extreme example, right? Um, of what I would say is the contested nature of Chinese food in America. Um, I mean, as you point out in sort of the coverage on the Panda Express scandal, um, you know, there's been a lot of questions about whether Chinese food in America is more American than Chinese, right? Um, and you know, one of the things we see um, with some of the sort of popular literature, um, for example, in the Fortune. Um, Cookie Chronicles by Jennifer A. Lee is really that, you know, when Chinese food comes to America, it really sort of radically has to modify because the American consumer isn't able to handle stuff that is unfamiliar. So basically everything that is Chinese becomes sweet, it becomes chicken. Um, and I think there was something else she brought up. It was sugar and chicken as the sort of the ingredients that Americans can handle the best. And so soon enough, everything is sweet. And what is sweeter than orange chicken really, right? It's breaded and deep fried and so served in this very thick sauce of, of corn syrup. Um, so like many Asian Americans, I grew up hating orange chicken um, in a sense because I felt it was, you know, sort of the epitome of fake Chinese, right? And when you would go home or if you went to a Chinese restaurant in China, you would have a very, very different experience, right? And the food I thought was so much richer, it was much more complicated, it was subtle. And in some cases it was lighter. 
Um, and so for me, the real question has been like, how do you think about orange chicken, especially if you're a historian and you know that food like people and their genes tend to change as it moves across space, you know? So one of the things I've been thinking about is how do you compare orange chicken to something like ramen, which is considered now, you know, a high sort of prestige food, right? I mean, there are, you can in sort of New York go out for a $25 bowl of ramen, right? Uh, ramen was originally a sort of ch ch uh, a pork noodle dish that went to Japan and then changed a lot really to meet sort of the culinary preferences of Japanese consumers, right? Um, it's not much like the sort of original dish. Um, or pad thai, which was at one point a Chinese stir fried noodle dish, maybe or Cantonese um, stir fried noodle dish um, made with rice. Um, once that got to Thailand, it became something quite different. And, you know, this is something that's quite interesting to me, which is many of us appreciate pad thai. We appreciate ramen, but we don't appreciate orange chicken. Um, and so one of the challenges, and this is what I mean by the sort of taking the orange chicken challenge is really to learn to think about orange chicken in, um, in, in a way that's historically sensitive um, and, and not a little bit less evaluative. Um, and, you know, for many of us, it's actually an emotional journey. It's really kind of coming to peace with the fact that Chinese people and Chinese culture, you know, sort of changes um, and reflects the environment it's, and it is in. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just sort of a natural sort of way of being. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, that, that's great. And that actually perfectly segues into what I wanted to ask Yang next. So Yang, um, you know, sticking with the theme of Americanized Chinese food, I mean, you wrote a book on the history of Chinese food and the history of Chinese restaurants in the United States. So could you maybe just walk us briefly through how a restaurant like Panda Express became possible and, and you know why is it the case that certain types of food like orange chicken became associated with Chineseness in the United States but are basically unheard of within China itself. Oops, Yang, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Well, first of all, thank you, Emily and the Lang Institute for hosting this event. Uh, it is a great pleasure and honor for me to be on the panel with Fuxia and Miranda and with the audience. One of the sad effects of the pandemic is that we have to talk about food in a webinar where you cannot taste, touch, and even smell the food. But in spite of the uh, pandemic, food continues to bring people together as it does right now. So I would like to start with two fundamental features of the cooking of China both of which will touch upon the important issue of culinary authenticity. Uh, uh, first, the first uh, feature of Chinese cooking uh, is that if you cook, uh, if you take a look at the history of the cooking of, of China, beginning from the Song Dynasty, you will see very clearly that it has never stopped evolving. Uh, so the evolution of Chinese food has been shaped by three main factors. Uh, the, the first one, uh, is um, the social economic development within what is now China. Okay. I, I'm not going to elaborate uh, on that. The second factor stems from interactions with cultures outside China. An you know, example of how imported foodstuffs, uh, foodstuffs have transformed the food of China is the chili pe uh, uh, pepper, which arrived in China in the late 16th century but it did not enter the realm of cooking for a long, long time. When, when it did, it transformed the cooking of several regions like, like Sichuan. You know, Fuxia is a uh, globally known expert on Sichuan cooking, right, which is known for its uh, spiciness. But most Sichuan dishes were not spicy until probably the 1920s and uh, perhaps even the 1930s. You know, a scholar recently has studied about 2,500 dishes uh, in Sichuan cooking in late Qin dynasty and found less than 20 dishes that were spicy. Uh, by the way, it is interesting to note that unlike corn and, and potato, the chili pepper is not a staple food. Right? It's not something that you absolutely uh, need uh, to, to sustain your life, but it has become a necessity in the cooking of numerous regional cuisines and in people's diet in those regions. And uh, you know, uh, the, the chili pepper is only one of the uh, many plant-based uh, foods 
that were introduced to China. Someone has counted. Uh, and uh, based on, on, the, uh, on the counting, there were uh, uh, there are about 150 or so main, vegetable, uh, main kinds of ve vegetables in Chinese food. And a majority or about 60% of them came from areas outside China. And among them, 30 or so came from the new world, from the Americas. And imported foodstuffs are not just limited to plant-based. Bird's nest, for example, comes from the islands off the coast of Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam, and did not enter the cooking of China until the late 19th century. Uh, the third factor that um, I would like to talk, uh, to talk about is the Chinese diaspora, uh, which is one of the longest lasting and most extensive extensive diasporas of the world. So in order to understand the importance of the diaspora for Chinese food's evolution, we must briefly discuss the second fundamental feature of the cooking of China, which is, you know, Chinese food consists of regional culinary traditions as Fuxia and Miranda just mentioned. And in this regard, Chinese food is similar to, let's say the cuisines, the cooking, of India and Italy, right? It, it is very different from, uh, from French food, which is, uh, uh, especially to outsiders, and dominated by the cooking of the capital, especially the food of the rich and powerful in, uh, in Paris. And as Fuxia also mentioned, you know, China does not have that kind of an imperial uh, uh, cuisine that dominates uh, the cooking of, of China. And there, uh, the, China, the food of China consists of numerous regional cuisines. And uh, uh, the, Chinese, the Chinese diaspora has been another space, a huge one, I should say, which has allowed Chinese regional traditions to continue to expand and multiply even beyond the, uh, the country's um, physical boundaries. You know, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of ex ex examples in Southeast Asian countries, for example, you can find a new Chinese food-based uh, fusion cuisine, it's called Baba cuisine. And in Peru, similarly, you have uh, another uh, cuisine that's, uh, um, that, that integrates the cooking of China and local cuisines, which is called Chifa. Uh, and the ways in which Chinese food evolved in different, in different parts of the world was influenced by local con conditions in the US, a very important local con condition that has shaped the Chinese food industry uh, in the country is the extraordinary anti-Chinese prejudice. Uh, you know, in the US, uh, the Chinese were segregated and their culture was looked down upon. So when they arrived in the US, beginning the Chinese immigrants, uh, beginning uh, during the Gold Rush, they, they did try to introduce the, the fancy dishes such as uh, sex fins and bird's nest to American diners, but they never succeeded. Because, you know, just imagine um, how possible uh, or how impossible it would be for main, mainstream diners to accept the food of a despised race as fine dining. So when the food of the Chinese did become popular around the turn of the 20th century, it was not a fine dining kind of uh, uh, dishes, rather it was the simple and inexpensive dishes that became popular, and I should say extraordinarily popular. And compared to Chifa and other uh, diasporic Chinese cuisines, Chinese food in the US also has remained more attached to its culinary roots in China. In the early decades, um, you know, the, uh, the Chinese uh, food industry did make a lot of uh, uh, um, adaptation, trying to cater to the uh, uh, cater their food to the taste of uh, um, non-Chinese diners uh, in, in, the, in the early in the early de decades. You know there uh, there were three kinds, main kinds of Chinese dishes that dishes that you can find in a Chinese American restaurant: uh, chop suey, egg foo yang, and chow mein. And of course, you have the fried rice, right? And orange chicken. Now, finally, I'm I'm, I'm coming to to the, to the question about orange uh, chicken. Orange chicken belongs to a new wave of Chinese di dishes that started to arrive in the 1970s. It has become 
uh, orange chicken uh, um, is one of the new Chinese American dishes that have become so popular. And Pan Express reportedly sold more than uh, close to 70 million pounds of orange, orange chicken back in 2013. And I think the number has continued to uh, to to increase, right? You know, this is an example of the kind of uh, adaptation that Chinese food has made, right? It's uh, um, it used a lot of uh, batter, uh, too much, I think, and uh, um, it, it's also very very sweet, right? You know, uh, the the use of uh, dry orange uh, appeals, I think, also disappeared in in most cases. So actually, I asked my my younger son yesterday, you know. Uh, who loves orange chicken. I said, why do you like orange chicken? And he said, how can you not like it, right? It's fried chicken in sweet sauce. Okay, and, uh, but then he said, I do not consider Americanized Chinese food Chinese. I like it when I compare to uh, fast food, right? So this is a, this is a very uh, insightful quote, I think. It's not because it's for my son, but I think it's uh, a lot of young people do share that, uh, uh, of the second generation Chinese Americans to share that uh, uh, that kind of a sentiment. Okay, so these dishes, the kung pao chicken, orange chicken, they represent um, a new regional cuisine in the diaspora, uh, which is called the Chinese American cuisine. This is not a term that I coined. Uh, it was coined by Chinese Americans back in in the first half of the 20th century. They called their food uh, Chinese. The Chinese American cuisine. Okay, so in the gastronom gastronomical world of Chinese cooking, right? You know the what pandax, uh, what uh, 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 kung pao chicken and orange chicken. You know those dishes represent. It's just uh, yet another new regional cuisine. It's different from other regional traditional uh, 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 traditions of Chinese cooking, like Sichuan, like Hunan, like Anhui. Uh, but its, uh, its uh, roots remained Chinese. Okay, that's, that's it. That's, that's great, Yang. Thank you so much for pointing out um, the really important role of the diaspora in crafting a new type of, of Chinese food. Um, and up until this point in the conversation, I mean, we've really been focusing predominantly on regional variation in, in Chinese cooking, but I also want to talk about how Chinese food transforms over time. And Yang, you had pointed out that um, Sichuanese food only really became associated with the chili pepper in the 20th century, which is something that I hadn't known before. Um, but Fuchsia, in the preface to new, your new book, The Food of Sichuan, I mean, you write that Sichuanese food has changed dramatically just over the relatively short period from when you were studying Sichuanese food in the mid 1990s um, up until today. So can you talk a little bit about the ways in which Sichuanese food has changed just over this relatively short period of time? And maybe you could hypothesize about why it's undergone these types of transformations. I would say the first thing is that a cuisine is always a living culture which is recreated every day in whichever circumstances it finds itself. So cuisines kind of inherently are responding to where they are now and what is available and who's eating them. So I, I just think that you know, any frozen notion of authenticity just collapses when it hits the real world. Um, but back to your precise question. So um, in the early, in the mid 1990s when I was living in Chengdu, China had been fairly isolated for, you know, for decades. And most restaurants um, in the city were serving what was something that was recognizable as Sichuanese local food. Now, the first thing to say is this in itself was not some age old <laughs> set in stone cuisine. Of course, as Yong was saying, the chili, relatively recent import, but there were also street snacks that seemed to bear the imprint of perhaps the Western missionaries and, and medics in Chengdu in the early 20th century, dumplings from Northern China. Sichuan has always been a region of immigrants. And um, so it's always been a fusion cuisine. But what happened in the decade since was that, you know, China began to open up in a new way. And I was part of that. My classmates and I were part of that. Um, 
so there were more, um, you know, foreigners started coming to China in greater numbers. Chinese people started traveling, going abroad to study. Um, also within China, um, there was the, a sort of new, with the changing economy, the branding of regional foods and then regional expansion. So for example, in the 1990s, I've forgotten which year, there was a restaurant called Baguo Buyi, specializing in the rustic cooking of the Chongqing area which opened in Chengdu and repackaged traditional food in this um, very clever way. So all the waitresses were wearing sort of country clothing and they had a, a fake tree in the dining room and they had pickle jars. So it was a sort of commoditization of regional Sichuanese cuisine. And then they opened lots of branches. And then of course, other cuisines, you know, other people from other parts of China started opening snack shops and restaurants in Chengdu. Um, KFC opened while I was there and that sort of opened the door to Western fast food. There's now pizza. And so the, the, the cuisine has just gone through another period of rapid change. So you can go out, young people in Chengdu will go out for Japanese one night, for Thai. Um, and also within Sichuan, there's been a great interest, particularly since A Bite of China, that sort of blockbuster TV series, which I think aired, was it 2012? I think that's right. Um, but anyway, um, in the, there's been an interest in cuisine as heritage and in culture. And so there have been chefs in Chengdu who've been going out to the countryside in southern Sichuan and bringing back specialities and putting them on menus in the city. So I would say that, um, that when I first lived in, in Chengdu, you could say that the, the cuisine had been through a period of stagnation for sort of economic and political reasons. And now ooh, it's off again. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, sticking with this theme of how Chinese food transforms over time, Miranda, I really wanted to get at your new research on dairy in Chinese cooking, which really intrigues me, uh, mainly because my stereotype is that Chinese food traditionally doesn't use a lot of dairy. So how does your research um, challenge this kind of conventional narrative? Okay, well, I mean, this is something, something I've been thinking a lot about. I mean, I mean, one thing I want to be clear with um, is that, you know, dairy, um, it really depends on where you are in China, right? I mean, if you're up by the border, you know, there's always been dairy because um, this is pastoral sort of land. But what I think really struck me in my research was how much dairy there was in the south of China, you know, or in the coastal areas of, in the Shanghai region, which at one point in the 17th century had been the dairy center um, of, uh, of in Chinese cooking. And it was so prolific there that the Dutch were surprised, you know, or, or struck by it, which I found very interesting. So, so things that I've taken away from this. One is really that, you know, stereotypes about Chinese cuisine don't tend to work, right? And in part because there's just so much history and also there's so much variety, right? So any generalization you come up with, there's going to be somewhere in China where the, the generalization is going to fall apart. Um, so that was my first lesson. Um, and then I think the second thing that I've been sort of interested in is a way that, you know, certain ingredients ebb and flow, you know, throughout the course of history. A lot of it has to do, I think, with resources, right? I mean, the Chinese population expands, this will put pressure on the land. Some foods will sort of fall out of fashion for largely economic and re reasons of resource. Um, so I you like to think about cuisines in relation to resources um, and everything else that's going on, you know, the economy, for example. And that, you know, that's one way of kind of like moving beyond this idea that there's some timeless, authentic Chinese cuisine. Um, when you think of cuisine, it's, you know, or food, really food ways is really the word I prefer to use. It's, it's a dynamic process. It's a way of nourishing and giving meaning to the world. And so we would expect to see a lot of variety, right? And we would like to see, we would expect to see time and space matter quite a bit. Um, and then the third sort of takeaway I've had um, is that I've been trying to think about milk as something more than just something you eat. It's also, you know, I think medicine. And, and this brings up, I think, a, maybe this goes back to my earlier work, but I've been very interested in the way that medicine and food intersect um, in sort of very powerful ways. And so, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've seen really um, throughout Chinese history is the heavy use of dairy products for medicinal purposes, for preserving health, for um, fixing broken bodies. Um, my favorite sort of cure actually is one that you find in Chinese medicine books, which is if you have the chronic runs, you know, you take cow's milk with long Indian peppers, right? Um, and that, you know, kind of makes us think more 
carefully about things like lactose intolerance and whether it's a, um, a factor, but also what, why we eat, right? We don't just eat because we're hungry. We eat, you know, for health um, to give meaning to also perform certain roles in society. And, and so that is where I would say, you know, milk was very useful as a medicine, as a symbol of imperial power in many cases, um, as a symbol of modernity, you know, and cosmopolitanism. And also as something that's really kind of easy to, you know, to do things with, and you can make, um, all sorts of really delicious food with milk, um, and including milk tea, right? Which is extremely popular today in China. Um, yeah, and milk tea has definitely been in the news recently with the, the Milk Tea Alliance. If you guys have been keeping up with events in Hong Kong and Thailand and Taiwan. There's this group of uh, young protesters who basically joined together under the symbol of milk tea to uh, protest against authoritarianism. So it's definitely this current that remains in place today. Um, and so I think for my, my final question, before we open it up to the Q&A, um, Yang, moving away from the, the past and kind of looking to the present and the future, um, what sort of concerns or trends do you think might shape the future of Chinese food or Chinese food consumption, either in China or the United States? I mean, something that we've been hearing a lot about whenever I go to China is the concern with the, the rise in obesity and the rise in, in diabetes. There's also been uh, recent campaigns against food waste. So what would you say, if uh, I had to kind of put you on the spot here, is the future of Chinese food? Well, I mean, that's a great question, but I don't know if historians are allowed to look into the future. Uh, so I'll give it a try. Um, well, you know, uh, looking back, uh, looking backward, right, we know that, you know, uh, among the important factors that have shaped a cuisine, including the, the food of China, um, uh, you, uh, you have uh, the, the, the social economic developments within China. Right, and you also have the interactions, culinary, cultural, and political with other cultures. Okay, so so I'm going to talk about those um, uh, by uh, by by discussing uh, just uh, uh, some of the main points, uh, two of the main points perhaps uh, uh, that I uh, that um, that that I made in an article that I co-authored with uh, a graduate student, uh, Claire Gordon Burdencore. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, who is a fabulous foodie and food, food scholar in an article about impact of the pandemic on Chinese food, both in China and, and the US. So um, uh, the, um, so the first one uh, 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 point that I wanna make is, you know, is that, that Chinese food is changing. It's at a crossroads, right? Because of the pan uh, of, of public con concerns which increased tremendously during the pandemic. Okay. And if you have had meals uh, in a Chinese family or in a restaurant with Chinese friends, you know that a prominent feature of Chinese food ways, I'm borrowing the word from, uh, from Miranda, uh, is communal style of e uh, eating. Right. That is, you know, in, uh, each individual uses her, his or her own chopsticks to, to grab the food from the plates on the table, right? Now this communal style of dining, of eating, you know, can be traced back to the Tang Dynasty, right? Centuries ago, uh, uh, you know, when um, the high tables and chairs were introduced uh, for the purpose of dining. Uh, and uh, 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 so to this day, uh, people see this centuries old, uh, feature of Chinese food ways, which is a communal style of dining, as a, a part of and as a reflection of Chinese culture, right, including social relations. You know, this is not new, right? You know, uh, an African American, a very famous African American chef in Savannah by the name of uh, uh, Mashama uh, Bailey once uh, recently said that the heart of many relations uh, relationships is surrounded by a meal. So the communal style of, of, of dining reinforces China's traditional social relations, right? Among friends, within the family and so on and, and so forth. And it is now under tremendous and increasing pressure to change, to change, right? Um, so I think the traditional social relations are also under 
tr tremendous pre pre pressure to change, you know, because of the unparalleled social and economic transformation of of the society, of the culture, of uh, of China. Okay. And the second point that I want to make is that during the pandemic, right, another trend already underway before the pandemic, you know, has been accelerated, right, which is more and more people are using online and mobile platforms for food delivery, right? People don't cook their food. People don't eat together with their food, perhaps, right? They just pick up the phone uh, or, you know, look at an app and, you know, order maybe Kung Pao chicken, maybe orange chicken, right? The Chinese version uh, of the dishes. And, you know, two of the most popular platforms, you know, uh, one called uh, which means, are you hungry? Right. Another is uh, Mei Tuan. Okay, you know, uh, back in 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 the middle of uh, 2018, right? These two platforms, the two organizations, have already amassed um, over 300 million registered users. 300 million registered users, and the, and during the pandemic, that number continued to rise to rise. Okay, so so the implication of this new way of consuming Chinese food, you know, it's tremendous, right? It's uh, you know, one delivered food tastes different. You know, during uh, in researching the article that I just mentioned on the impact of the pandemic on, on, on Chinese food in, in in China, I interviewed a lot of people, you know, in, including restaurant owners, right, through WeChat, okay, or, or over a phone uh, a phone call. And uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, owners of a fairly large chain in in the city of Wuhan, you know, said, you know, you cannot deliver traditional uh, Chinese food for authentic authentic uh, experiences. You know, just food tastes different, right? When delivered, and uh, in other words, you know, he said, good traditional authentic, if you want to use that word, Chinese food, and how. You know, it's not meant for delivery, okay? And uh, um, uh, so changes in the ways the people in China consume their food, I think underlines the profound social and cultural transformation of the country, as I mentioned earlier, right? You know, people, uh, people have very busy jobs, you know, they spend less and less time with their family or even with their friends, right? You know, the distance between family members and, 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 and among friends, I think it, it's growing, right? So you don't need, you know, uh, because, because, because of all those fa factors, you can you just, you know, food is just something to take care of, right? It's, uh, it's not uh, something no longer to be enjoyed with friends as much as, uh, as it used to be, right? Uh, Chinese food is also at a crossroads in the US. Right. Um, the Museum of the Food of uh, uh, Food and Drink in Brooklyn, in in New York. For those of you who have not been to the mu museum uh, um, in New York, when when you go there, you know it's a museum worth vi visiting. Recently, uh, did a, a, an exhibit on the history of Chinese uh, of Chinese restaurants in the U.S., for which I serve for which I serve as uh, one of the academic advisors. And according to the, the exhibit, there are still over over 50,000, about 50,000 Chinese, 50, Chinese restaurants in the US, right? So Chinese food is still the most popular, but at the same time, competition is growing, right? It's no longer new, exotic, exciting, right? So where do, where does Chinese food go from here? This is one of the questions that a lot of people in the Chinese food industry have been asking since, you know, for at least 20, 20 some years. Right, you, know, you have competition from from Korean, from uh, Vietnamese, and, and me me Mexican. The list goes on and on. Um, and during the pandemic, Chinese food has suffered a lot more so than though than the restaurants in any other cuisines. Right, this is not just because of the uh, coronavirus. Right, it's also because of the surging of the growing anti-Asian. Uh, sentiments, right? Which, for example, increased fivefold in New York City, a very cosmopolitan place. Okay, and uh, also, you know, I want to conclude by 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 stating that the Mount 
mounting tension between the US and China is creating an enormous amount of uncertainty for the future of Chinese restaurants. Well, thank all of you for um, your fascinating remarks. We have about 20 questions in the Q&A queue, so <laughs> let's get to them uh, as soon as possible. Um, so a lot of these questions are sort of geared toward one of you, and I'll ask it um, pointedly to, to one of you, but if others want to chime in, then that, that's fine as well. So I'm going to start with a question for Miranda. Um, in your talk, you had compared um, orange chicken to things like pad thai and ramen. Um, um, and this question asks, why is authenticity held as a value for certain ethnic foods? How is it marketed to add value to certain types of dining experiences? Okay, well, thank you. I mean, this is a, a really key question. I guess I have been interested in why authenticity just is kind of something that hangs over Chinese food uh, so much, right? Um, I mean, I live here in the Midwest. This is not my native land, uh, the Californian. And I have always, you know, I. I recently found out in the last few years that hamburgers are, you know, were invented in Germany, but no one ever talks about, you know, this is an inauthentic Americanized hamburger, right? Even though there are clear differences in how the, how the recipes work. And so, you know, and this has made me sort of think that, you know, authenticity is in some ways a bailiwick it's used to kind of beat up Asian, especially Chinese Americans. And it's been around there. It's been around for a very long time. Um, at least, you know, since the late 19th century. So as long as there has been Chinese restaurants, I think there's been a lot of anxiety in the United States that uh, they're not getting the real thing, that they're in some ways being fooled. Um, you know, and I think this has been generalized, I think more broadly to talk about, you know, sort of the ways in which Asian Americans, you know, are sort of imperfect vessels for the sort of ancestral culture. Um, and I think generally speaks to a larger issue of, you know, even if you're here for generations, you're not really considered Americans, right? Um, and I think that's really the reason why authenticity matters so much is that, you know, there is a distrust of these, a, peop, a group of people that are, you know, always outsiders, right? Whereas hamburgers have like, you know, completely different sort of set of standards that I'm applied to them. And they're, you know, um, because it's in part the dominant ethnic group in the United States, um, they don't, you know, they're not, they're not, you know, asked to represent, an, you know, a foreign culture. Um, so that, that would be my first thought. Um, which is the question actually just the fact that authenticity comes up at all. Um, a question for you, Yang. Um, this comes actually from uh, another one of our UCI colleagues, Robin Keller in the business school. And she wants to know how or if changes in Chinese food in California um, restaurants has followed immigration patterns from China to California. So Cantonese, Sichuanese, et cetera. That's a very good question. It actually has followed the, the changes of the, of the Chinese cuisine in California has followed the uh, changing patterns of Im immigration from, uh, from China um, in general, right? So in the, uh, before the 1960s, right? In other, precisely before the passage of the 1965 Im Immigration Reform Act, which transformed America uh, socially and ethnically, you know, before that, the Chinese food in the uh, food industry okay, uh, remained predominantly Cantonese, right? And then, you know, uh, when, uh, uh, with the passage of, of the 1965 Immigration Act, you know, Taiwan received uh, um, a quota of, of immigrants uh, uh, of 20,000. Uh, 20,000, right? We, we, which is a quota that uh, every other, uh, you know, every other nation received. And China was re received the quota as the Republic of China at, at the time. Okay, so uh, a growing number of people arrived uh, uh, from Taiwan, and those were not, um, you know, people um, born in Taiwan for the mo most part. You know, uh, many of them were, were born in China. And went to Taiwan in in, in 1949 uh, before coming to California, before coming to other parts of, of, of the country, right? So when they arrived in California and in New York, you know, they started to open uh, to open Taiwanese restaurants. It's actually not Taiwanese restaurants. So, so here's another uh, layered story. Okay, when the people, um, uh, the the Chinese foreigners went to Taiwan 
1949. Okay, they brought also the regional traditions of Chinese cooking to Taiwan. So, so, so Taiwan, so Taipei, for example, became a great melting pot part of regional cuisines. Uh, you know, creating new new traditions, new uh, fusion Chinese fusion cuisines, if you will, right? And upon their arrival in the U.S., they brought those cuisines to to the U.S. Uh, to American cities, right? And uh, so, uh, you know, that's why you started to have uh, Sichuan food. You started to have uh, uh, Hunan food. And in many cases, you know, this is not uh, the pure Sichuan food directly from Sichuan. This is a, a sort of a layered, <laughs> layered Sichuan food by way of Taipei often. Okay. And, and, uh, and then, you know, after the opening up of, of China, you know, uh, right after the, you know, the China, uh, the, what well, the US and China normalized their, their diplomatic relations in, in, in uh, uh, 1979, China, mainland China started to receive uh, uh, the same quota of 20,000 immigrants, right? And uh, so when those people arrived, especially, you know, when the uh, wealthier new immigrants are, are started to arrive in China, they, they you know, brought new, uh, even more refreshing restaurants from, uh, from mainland China, right? Which allows us to take a look at uh, how, that, how dynamic, the cooking of China really is, you know, how rich. Yeah, so by the way, uh, there, is, there is another change, you know, with the arrival of the most recent immigrants, you know, a lot of them came with, uh, with, uh, um, with capital, with middle-class resources, right? So the, uh, the, the old trend of adaptation started to change, right? People, um, in many cases, people no longer change their food. So they say, here is, uh, food from Sichuan. Uh, here's food from uh, Xi'an as it is served in, Sichuan, uh, in Xi'an. Okay, uh, Fuxia has a comment to, to make. Well, I just like to add to that something you were just touching on there, which is that, you know, the peculiar history of immigration in the States after the Exclusion Act, that Chinese people spread out into communities where they were quite isolated and they were all cooking for, for white Western tastes. And something similar happened in here in Britain, where a lot of Chinese people took over fish and chip shops, and they were the only Chinese people in the town. So it was a cuisine of adaptation. And that one of the really interesting things that's happened with the new immigration from China is not only that you've got people from different parts of China, not only Cantonese settling in the United States and in Britain, but also they no longer have, they're not, not catering for Westerners. So there are so many restaurants starting out in Chinese communities like the San Gabriel Valley and places where there are a lot of Chinese students and they might serve the equivalent of orange chicken for the, the, you know, the mainstream American guests, but they are giving their mainland customers what they want to eat. And so Chinese diaspora cuisine is actually beginning to mirror fashions in China um, rather than in America. So like the Sichuanese craze, for example, it's not only because there are Sichuanese people living in the United States, it's because people from all over China now want to eat um, Sichuanese food. So wherever they are, Sichuanese restaurants are springing up. Um, Fuchsia, this is a, a question that um, maybe is best answered by you since you have written so extensively on, on Chinese food for Western audiences, but what do you think is the best way to educate more Westerners about the nuances of Chinese cuisine? And do you think that potentially a way to open more minds about China and Chinese culture can be through people's stomachs? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I think that it's one of the best ways to experience an unfamiliar culture for sure. Uh, and I think that um, I think the issue with Chinese food has generally been communication. So a lot of the people presenting Chinese food in the West didn't really have English skills. So you would have um, restaurants. I mean, I saw this a lot when I was reviewing Chinese restaurants in London 20 years ago, that um, restaurants would have the predictable, you know, British Chinese set menus, which were very accessible. And they would also ha often have really nice, genuine, mainly Cantonese dishes, but real Chinese cooking. And the waiters usually didn't speak good English. 
um, the Western customers, if they ordered something that turned out to have lots of bones in it or was made with fatty pork, would complain. And so the waiters ended up thinking that it wasn't worth trying to give people unfamiliar things. So you ended up having this segregation with even, and I think you have that in the States too, of Chinese language menus with the really authentic food on it. And then the English menu would be just easy food for people who wanted the familiar Chinese food. And I think what's changed really dramatically in the last, even in the last decade, is that now there are a lot of restaurants springing up in places like New York, in places like London, um, which are being opened by young Chinese people who are essentially bilingual. You know, they've been educated in the West. They speak very good um, English and they are able to present things in a way which grabs people's attention and which explains them, you know, so that's one great advantage. I think also just the opening up of China, the fact that um, more Westerners have had the chance to go to China and normally have an amazingly positive impression of the food because it's so varied and fantastic. And also just that China is also becoming richer and more powerful. And I think that that is always, you know, like it or not connected with the prestige of a cuisine. So I think that the old sort of stereotypes about, you know, that awful stereotype about Chinese people, you know, eating anything because they were desperate, you know, which I don't think was ever true because the adventurousness of Chinese cuisine is to do with cultural curiosity and a very developed and refined culture as much as it was, you know, people eating every part of the animal, which you find in any sort of agrarian culture. But I just think that, yeah, it's, um, it's a communication problem. And I think we're now in a, in a place where real Chinese food is more accessible and there are more tools to, um, to, to sort of explain to, to Westerners what's going on and to reassure them that this dish is meant to have bones in it, or the fact that it has a slithery texture is because that's something that is prized and appreciated and it can expand your appreciation of food, not that it's some, you know, weird and difficult ingredient. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, could I just add to that? I, I think those are uh, very thoughtful, uh, wonderful points, uh, you know, about the function of food as a cultural bridge, right? But the, but the, uh, the, uh, the connection between the mind and the stomach at the same time should not be overstated, I think, uh, because, you know, uh, let, let's use Chinese food as, as, as an example, right? You know, Chinese, uh, which started to become extremely popular uh, around the turn of the, of the 20th century, right? But does, you know, that does not mean that China, you know, uh, um, that China as a country, Chinese culture, Chinese food, uh, 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 received more respect, you know, uh, again, you know, for a long time, for many decades, you know, uh, in the early uh, part of the, of the uh, 20th century, you know, uh, Chinese food was still looked down upon, uh, was, uh, and, and, and did not receive the kind of re respect it deserves. You know, a, a very famous New York Times uh, food critic once wrote that, you know, uh, uh, you know, Chinese food is not uh, your kind of a pre-opera kind of uh, uh, cuisine to have, uh, saying that Chinese food does not go well with puccini, right? I think uh, there is still a lot of truth to that, especially uh, with regards to Americanized Chinese food. You know, it's basically, as my son said, it's a, it's a fast food kind of thing, right? So, so people go there, you know, for, uh, for the convenience, for the portion. Right and uh, um, for the low cost, right and uh, you know not necessarily for an appreciation of the food of China or its culture. Mm -hmm. May I get in there really quickly? Because I was thinking about you know sort of the two points um, Fusha and Young made, and one thing that I, I you know I was reading, I, um, you know, Crescendo Ray says that you know the next big thing in you know in sort of ethnic food in the United States will be high end Chinese, right? Because of the the fact that you know Chinese immigrants are no longer opening restaurants to make a living. They're they're doctors, or you know sometimes when they want to be renegades, they can become haute cuisine chefs. You know, um, well, but one thought I thought would like to see is Chinese American food getting its respect, right? I mean, this is actually the Orange Chicken Challenge. Can we, you know, 
when will we be willing to put 30 to shell out 30 bucks for a plate of orange chicken? You know, I mean, what kind of mindset do we need to have to, you know, achieve that? You know, why are we willing to pay for ramen instead of, you know, orange chicken? And, and so maybe, you know, maybe Chinese American food needs to come into its own and, you know, and, and we need to sort of adjust the way people think about that, you know, and, and why it's, you know, different from Peking duck, for example. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, so, yeah, well, sure, go ahead. And I could add something, but I think, um, you know, one thing about Chinese cuisine is that um, the, Chinese, the, the Chinese restaurants in the West don't tend to put such a premium on the quality of the ingredients, as in the provenance, the terroir. And if you think of sort of the, the most um, sought after Californian restaurants, it's all about produce. And the irony, of course, is that in classical Chinese cuisine, it was all about the, the produce and where it came from and the quality. But that's something that's been a bit lost. Um, you know, partly because Chinese cuisine in America developed as something that was a tool of survival for immigrants who were serving, you know, cheap food in quite difficult circumstances. But I think that my dream really is that um, Chinese food, the, the extraordinary technique and variety and art of it will be remarried with this attention to ingredients. And that's when everyone will start paying attention. Um, there's one restaurant that I've written about in Hangzhou, the Dragonwell Manor, where they are doing that. And that for me is an expression of sort of the greatness of Chinese cuisine. Um, and I, I think we're going in that direction. You know, I think that people are, as China has more prestige and as Chinese restaurateurs are, uh, uh, becoming more ambitious and also have the cultural tools to present their cuisine more easily. Um, I think we have to be going in that direction. So a question that maybe Miranda and Yang would be best positioned to answer, um, how has the Chinese student population in the United States affected recent food trends here? Uh, Miranda, you had ask the question of will there ever be a time when orange chicken is seen as haute cuisine and I know that uh, on UCI's campus I mean we have a Panda Express right here and it's immensely popular with international students mainly because it's convenient and, and cheap so how do you see the population of, of international students maybe changing the shape of Chinese food here? Oh uh, you know I actually I, it's funny that you bring up Panda Express because one of my undergraduates from China wrote a long sort of like panegyric to Panda Express um, which I thought was fascinating, you know? Um, so I guess there's two ways of thinking about this. I think of the student population as often young people who don't have a lot of time to cook, right? And so they want their soul food, right? Or their comfort food um, quickly. And so that, that can definitely change the sort of scene around campus. Um, but the area where I see the most impact so far has been like, you know, bubble tea and cheese tea, right? Which, you know, one of the first places it started to spring up and become extremely popular was college campuses, right? Um, places where there were a lot of international students. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, this I think goes back to some of the points that Fusha made, but I feel like that there is an aspect where when you have, you know, a population that is, you know, directly from China that has resources, the trends in the home country are reflected, you know, you know, in the places where they go to school. Um, and that is definitely the case in Ann Arbor. We have, you know, too many places, I think, to get bubble tea. Um, and then the other thing is the, the fascination with, you know, the Chinese American, or the Chinese student population with um, other Asian cuisines, right? Um, I mean, my students eat a lot of Korean food, so I could see that also changing the sort of the sort of environment in which um, people, you know, this sort of culinary scene around campuses. Um, Fuchsia, two kind of interrelated questions for you. One uh, is asking about how um, the, the rise of Shanghai as a global international city has maybe changed the shape of, of Shanghai cuisine. And then the other question is asking um, if you have, developed an interest in interstitial cuisines, cuisines that don't necessarily map onto a particular space or region. 
Okay, um, well, the first question, I mean, Shanghai has always been a really interesting example of a sort of cultural melting pot. And in fact, you know, we've been talking a lot about American Chinese food, but the Shanghainese have a local form of Western food, da cai, sort of Western food. And it's very funny for a Westerner because you go there and you eat your sort of something like a schnitzel and your borscht, your Lawson Tang, your Russian soup and um, your, uh, you know, Russian potato salad. And it's all... Um, sort of sort of Western food, but it's curated in a way that's particularly Shanghainese, and that's part of the local food culture. And then Shanghainese food itself is a really interesting mixture. You know, when people talk about the Nbang Tsai, the local Shanghainese cuisine, it draws on really quite different traditions from within the Jiangnan region. So the very sweet and elegant food of Suzhou and Wuxi, the sort of delicate flavors of Hangzhou, these wonderful bright seafood and pickle flavors of Ningbo and these earthy fermented tastes from Shaoxing, all in its own little melting pot. And um, and then what's and, and I find um, you know as a Western person in China, Shanghai is a place where people really go both ways. So I have Chinese friends there who are just as happy drinking Western wine with Shanghainese food or going out for a Western meal. And in that sense, it's a bit like Hong Kong. It's very cosmopolitan. And of course, what's happened um, in the last few decades is that you could eat anything in Shanghai. There are lots of Western chefs opening. You can have Peruvian food one night, Spanish, then you can have the food of Shaoxing. So um, I think Shanghai is really interesting. But the, the sort of irony in a way is that perhaps, you know, the local cuisines of the Jiangnan region are being possibly eclipsed by the grand drama of chilies and Sichuanese and particularly abroad that we really don't see much that reflects the beauty and the delicacy of the food of this region. We've got the Shengjian Bao and the Xiaolong Bao and these sort of snacky foods which are becoming popular but not very much to reflect the whole cuisine. And, and then the sort of um, question about cuisines on the boundaries, I find utterly fascinating. And, um, you know, there are examples like I was in Yunnan recently and in Yunnan you find the food, you know, for someone who's particularly been studying something, you know, what one calls Chinese food, here it's all blending into the cuisines of Vietnam and Laos and Burma in ways which in most other parts of China would not seem very Chinese at all. Um, and I think it's just a reminder that, you know, we create these neat, neat little categories of cuisines but, um, you know, they, they, they don't really exist. They're all sort of psychological constructs and actually all cuisines are busy interacting and involving all the time. Um, so a couple more questions uh, before we have to end. Um, this person wants to know if there's a social hierarchy of tastes in China. For example, some people say that Cantonese cuisine or Yuetsai is a higher cuisine because it valorizes pure and light tastes and the original flavors compared to the more spicy food of other regions in China. So what do you think of this? Have you ever heard any sort of discussion about a kind of hierarchy of, of Chinese food within China or among the diaspora? Um, you want, yeah, oh. if, Fuchsia, if you want to take this one and if others want to chime in as well. Yeah, um, oh, definitely. And um, it's quite funny, actually, because um, a friend of mine who's a very excellent Chinese food writer um, sat me down a few years ago and said, you know, Fuchsia, you really can't consider yourself a true Chinese gourmet if you think that Sichuanese food is the best. And he sort of implied that I would grow up and then appreciate Cantonese and Jiangnan food more. And the funny thing is that actually I have. <laughs> and so much as I still love Sichuanese food, I now deeply appreciate the sort of more understated beauty of Cantonese and Jiangnan cooking. But I think there is, you know, a sort of slightly snobbish idea that the food that's more elusive and the food that's more about fine ingredients is more prestigious. And that, um, you know, Sichuanese food, for example, it's often seen as a sort of, um, you know, a bit of a peasanty cuisine, really delicious, but where you've just got all these sort of flavoring. Citronese chefs, I should add, would strongly dispute this. Um, but I think that there is, there is that sort of idea that, um, that the real elite is, is something very um, um, subtle and delicate. Over to you two. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I don't, think there's a 
national pattern of hierarchy among cuisines. I really don't think so. I think this is also very, very localized. Okay, and it, it, you know, the, there, you know, there are uh, changing waves of popularity right, among different cuisines. Now, you know, Sichuan is very pop popular across the nation. But even at this moment, you know, if you go to places, uh, uh, Fuxia talked about uh, um, Jiangnan food, right, so, uh, Southeast China. You know, uh, the, you know, the capital of Jiangnan cuisine, in my humble opinion, is Yangzhou, right? Uh, so for people who love Chinese food, who uh, you should go to Yangzhou, okay. Uh, put that on your, on your uh, itinerary for, um, for travel, um, travel plans. So, so if you go to Yangzhou right now, and, and uh, I don't think, you know, uh, people have the same kind of a craze or even respect for Sichuan food as people in other places do. Right? So again, it's a vast country and it's very, uh, 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 food habits, you know, perceptions of, of hierarchy or realities of that change geographically uh, tremendously. Okay? And uh, uh, it has, you know, if there is some hierarchy, even uh, in different uh, uh, locales, it, 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 it based on, on the, uh, the ingredients, the price and the price of service, right? Cantonese tends, tends to be more expensive, I think because of, of the ingredient, you know, a lot of fre uh, fresh, high quality seafood, right? They have to charge more, right? And, uh, but you can, you know, go to uh, Yunnan, go to Yunnan Kunming, right? You know, go to a private kitchen, right? People serve very local, uh, ingredients in, in their di dishes and they charge you a lot. It, it's, the, it's the prestige that is attached to this uh, sort of, a, you know, the, ve the venue of a private kitchen. So I mean, if I could just ch uh, chime in here, I was, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, one thing I've been sort of, every year, I, except for this year, I, I go on some road trip over Thanksgiving to China, um, usually with collaborators. And what I've always been impressed with is how um, Chinese like to do a sort of like, you know, have a change of Taiwan, you know, go somewhere, try the food, you know, um, and I, I don't see so much of a hierarchy as Chinese being very interested in knowing places and their tastes, you know, and that I find that attitude really sort of in some ways refreshing, especially compared to sort of the snob, food snobbery I see in the United States where, you know, it's very class and regional. Um, and so this is something I would like to, you know, I hope we can learn from them actually. Um. So maybe as one final question, we, we've gotten a lot of questions asking for recommendations for further reading, for cookbooks, um, obviously Fuchsia, you're probably the, the go-to person for cookbooks, but maybe we can just kind of sort of go down the line and if you could give recommendations on, I don't know, a particular uh, reading that you find really interesting on the history of Chinese food or a particular cookbook that you often reference, I think that would be a, a nice way to end and we can maybe collate or collect all of these recommendations and send them out to our attendees after the event. Um, but Yang, do you want to take a stab at this first? <laughs> well, actually, you know, uh, cookbooks, that's one of the topics that I, that I wrote about in my Chop um, Suey USA book. So for people who want a comprehensive list, can go to the chapter on that, uh, in that book. Um, but, uh, you know, very brief, uh, uh, briefly, a very iconic cookbook published in uh, right after World War II by a Chinese American author, um, uh, uh, by Yang Zhao, uh, uh, how to cook uh, uh, and eat in in Chinese. So it has uh, it has been one of the most popular cookbooks on on uh, on Chinese cooking, and uh, one of the first to define what makes Chinese food Chinese. Okay, so it, it's a fascinating book to uh, uh, to, to to read. And second point is uh, a lot of people now uh, no longer read cookbooks, right? They go to YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which has a lot of very, very good, uh, 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 good sources. Uh, one of the uh, people that, I, that I'm that i watching recently is a Westerner living in China 
you know, by uh, uh, the, the channel um, is entitled Chinese Food Demystified. So I just watched that a few. So it's not a recommendation, perhaps, but uh, for whatever it's worth, it's, it's worth checking out. It's, it's pretty fun. Yeah, because one of the episodes talks about uh, orange chicken. <laughs> um, Fuchsia, do you want to take a stab at this? And self-promotion is perfectly acceptable here. <laughs> Oh, well, one one cookbook that um, that I like very much is Yan Kit So's. Um, what's it? The classic food of China. I think that's the title. And um, she's someone who I knew when I was just starting out and was a very serious scholar and a wonderful cook. And um, so this is a compilation of sort of recipes from across China. Um, but it's got a particularly excellent introduction, which gives you a real overview of, of some of the, particularly the historical sources and the legends about Chinese cuisine. So I really would recommend that. Um, and also, um, what's it called? The Food, the Food of China by E.N. Anderson, Eugene Anderson, which is a a wonderful sort of cultural introduction to Chinese food. So those are two books which were particularly useful to me in opening up the whole subject, I think. Great, thank you. And Miranda? Uh, so I, I guess I'll make two kinds of recommendations. For cookbooks, I I, I, I read everything that Fuchsia puts out and I also spend a lot of time with Carolyn Phillips' um, cookbook, which is sort of a sort of a a compendium of different recipes from the you know the various cuisines um and then in terms of like sort of historical stuff i i you know as one of the editors of global food history i'm gonna have to make a plug for the journal and so i would say you know please take a look at global food history we just did a fantastic special issue that was edited by michelle king on the regional cuisines of china Great. Well, thank you all for um, participating in this. We are just out of time. So I want to again thank my wonderful pan panelists, Fuchsia Dunlop, Yang Chen, and Miranda Brown, and to all of you for attending. Um, the next Long Institute event will be a two-part series on what the November elections mean for the future of the U.S.-China trade war. If you're interested in that topic, or if you just want to keep on top of what the Long Institute is up to, please take a minute, sign up for our mailing list. I just put the link in uh, the chat. And until then, have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Bye.